Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get into our Father's Word, back into this book of Judges. Remember, a judge was a ruler in a theocracy, that is to say, between God and man, and as a ruler of Israel. But ultimately, Israel would want a king, and God's going to be good enough to give them one, though he, our father, wanted to be king. But they wanted somebody they could see, and boy, did they get somebody. Now, we're coming up to the 13th chapter. This is the 13th judge, will be Samson. And as I had forestated, there were 13, and we're actually 15. We have Eli and uh, Samuel, I believe it is, to go. So with that thought in mind, um, God did a very strange thing with Samson. Rather than have the Philistines angry after a 40-year captivity, oppression by the Philistines, He picked one man, and Samson would not lead an army. He was the army. God is showing you how one person can make a difference. Thus, with the Philistines being angry at Samson, that will be God's plan, and that's exactly the way we will do it. They did not um, beat down Israel any more so than they already were. They took it out on Samson. With that thought in mind, chapter 13, verse 1, let's go with it in the great book of Judges. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. Forty, of course, in biblical numerics is probation, and it was the longest captivity of any of the oppressions during the time of the Judges. Verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah, that's to say Hornet, of the family of the Danites of the tribe of Dan, whose name was Manoah, which means rest. And his wife was barren and bare not. It would seem that when a real special person is born of woman, that it has always been to a woman that was barren, And there was a divine intervention from Almighty God because God will give this one Samson superhuman strength and ability as uh, as he utilizes him as the judge of Israel, but yet the army composed of within himself. Verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, Now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Verse 4. Now therefore beware. This means you be very careful. I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. That is to say, while you're carrying this child and while you're, while you're trying to conceive, eat food God's way. That's very good advice, not only then, but now. Do it God's way, all right? It's very important. Verse 5, For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. In other words, I choose him even before he enters the womb, inasmuch as she has not yet conceived, through the time of the womb and for his life, I claim him he's mine. That's what God is saying. Nazarite means one separated. This one was separated to the service of God. Not self-appointed, as many are, but appointed by God himself. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. That was the purpose. 
and that's that's the vow that God uh, insisted that she make, in as much as um, she was not not um, a mother, in as much as being the mother of children at this time, and I know that she would naturally consider this to be a blessing. So this mother would give birth to a total army in one person. Because truly this angel of the Lord in saying, set this one aside. Now, there are many, uh, a type is always a type. And who was another Nazarite that was a very special birth other than Christ himself, who was called the Nazarene? And if you're not familiar with the vow of a, uh, of a Nazarite, uh, Numbers chapter 6 gives you a, a layout of that for both men and women. Do I, do I recommend the vow? No, I do. Well, not necessarily, unless you are led with God to overtake it. Verse 6. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. This would be better translated awe-inspiring. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. I, I don't know where he was from. He didn't tell me his name. I don't know who he was. And naturally, the thought here, I know she believed, but it was just so awe-inspiring to her that I'm sure she would like to have had a little bit of reassurance, okay? Now, verse 7. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. It's into her life. And he was. He certainly wasn't perfect. He sinned at times. But I, kind of, I suppose uh, if I were an attorney, I would like to take the case that perhaps he did not sin in as much as God, when he set him aside, pretty well controlled him in all things he did, as we will find out. Verse 8. Then Manoah <clears throat> entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God, which thou didst sin, come again unto us. He includes his wife, us. And teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Tell us, um, in as much as you have set him aside, tell us what we should teach him, how we should raise him, how we should train him, probably better said. Verse 9. And God hearkened to the voice of uh, Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Again, it would be the woman that would be touched. And the conception would take place. Uh, it was predestined at this time, if you would, that she would conceive and that she would give birth to this child. But God, inasmuch as the man had asked, and if something isn't clear in your mind, if you ever feel you're led of God, then ask him again. No harm done. He will either answer or not, whether yea or no, ten. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold! The man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. He's here. In other words, she's going after him, the eleven. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And of course, that being the sacred name, Ea Asha, Ea, I am that I am. So we have here the reappearance of this angelic being who has brought the seal of the Nazarite to this one Samson. 
divine intervention is a fantastic thing. It is awe-inspiring. And it does not happen often. And out of all the judges, it happened only occasionally. Verse 12, And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? How shall we train the child? Better translated to modern English. And how shall we do unto him? Uh, what's going to be his work? And what should we train him uh, in his work? What, what Tell us. That was very cooperative in as much as they believed. They certainly believed it was going to happen or they would not have asked this question. But I'm sure that they are both still surprised, perhaps uh, startled, but no doubt happy as well. Verse 13, And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I s said unto the woman, let her beware. That means let her be careful, let her do it, see that she does it. Now, I don't know if you caught it or not. She mentioned to her husband that uh, concerning the wine and so on and so forth, but um, she did not mention that uh, no razor should come on his head. She did not pass that on. Not that it's of that much importance, but it is ironic that that will be the very thing that will be his downfall if he had a downfall because he still had victory even within that, okay? So certainly we see then that God's hand was on this one before the conception, before the soul left God in heaven to be placed in that embryo. Well, how do you know? Well, it returns to the Father from which it came. That's how you know that you came from God, your spirit, soul, your flesh, uh, spiritual body that entered the flesh, the embryo, naturally. Okay? Now, we'll go on to the next verse now. Verse 14. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine nor strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All... Underline that. All that I commanded her, let her observe. You beware. You be very careful of this. Um, again, no mention of hair, as, as was mentioned back in verse 5. 15. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. That would be an appropriate gift. Uh, in appreciation, and I'm sure he wanted to hang on to him for reassurance, more questions. People can certainly be full of questions at a time like this, 16. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I, this is important, I will not eat of thy bread. I'm not going to eat any of your food. This word in the Hebrew means food of all sorts, actually. But if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. In other words, <clears throat> uh, God goes to great length to keep people from worshiping ange angelic beings. They are messengers. It so happens that this particular one is the angel of God, meaning, in a sense, that very presence of the Godhead itself. But all in all, and still, he wants Manoah to know for certain this blessing did not come from an angel. It did not come from a child of God. It came from God. And many of you today, you forget that. And many of your blessings come directly from God, and you, you thank other people, but you never quite get around to thanking Him. And He takes that very seriously. Okay, next verse, 17. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. 
this was kind of, this would get under the wire. In other words, uh, give God the credit, but at the same time, be thankful for the one that brought the message that we can we can be thankful for you as well. 18. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Well, actually in the manuscripts, the word secret is a little far stretched here. The word is <clears throat> wonderful. Seeing in the Hebrew. You can check it out yourself with your Strong's Concordance. Seeing it is wonderful. And do you not remember Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that there would be another Nazarene who would say, He is called wonderful? Okay, are you beginning to get the picture? There is a great deal in our Father's Word if we take a moment. As a matter of fact, I would not doubt that my little old King James Version here, yes, it does. It, uh, it translates it also as well as secret wonderful, all right? So that's real easy for you to do if you have a, um, uh, a comparative um, or cross-referenced uh, work. Perhaps it's done for you. Now, so we see then that this one is in fact a part, the angel of God, when God himself wishes to make an appearance that he sins, first because a man could not look upon the full Godhead at one time, in, in the flesh body, more act, pr properly, properly stated. 19. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord, and the angel did wondrously. Something, probably better translated, something very wonderful happened. And Manoah and his wife looked on. And, of course, the next verse tells us what it was that wonderfully happened. But again, leaning toward that word, wonderful. Verse 20, for it came to pass, this was it, when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar, and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. In other words, he simply went up with them. Um, he ascended in the very flames of the offering to God, documenting that the offering was for God, went to God, and was well received. And certainly no human being could accomplish such a wonderful sight, if you would as was portrayed, to document in the minds of these two that they should support this babe that would soon be in the womb through his entire life in whatever way they could to bring it to pass God's plan for this child, all right? And on falling to the ground in reverence, verse 21, but the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. That was it. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And then, as the old saying was there, all die that look upon the face of God. Fear begins to strike his heart. Let's pick it up in the next verse, 22. And Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. Now, Manoah was a very wise person in that he had chosen a very wise woman. She was a little more of a thinker than he was because she takes things under her control and utilizes some common sense. And sometimes it's difficult to get, to get back to plain old common sense after having seen the supernatural. Verse 23, this is how she did it. Common sense. She's a thinking woman. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering 
and a meat offering at our hands, neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would, as at this time, have told us such things as these. In other words, he came to tell us that there was going to be a child born through us that would deliver Israel. Now, how in the world can you consider, old man, that he's going to kill us? In other words, she was rationing this out, and certainly it was true. Um, there's quite a story, and if you see the face of God, you die, and it's in Exodus, it's in Deuteronomy, but actually no one has ever died from having seen God. So, um, and actually, several have. Hagar, um, Moses in a very near position, and now these two, the angel of God, anytime you see the angel of God, you've seen that part of God that man can absorb. Verse 24, and I, may I say Emmanuel, God with us, the name of Christ, the Nazarene. 24, and the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. Uh, Samson means like the sun, all right? But it can also be translated sunny, and certainly he was. I'm sure with God's blessings, he was a beautiful child to look upon. Verse 25, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between uh, Zorah and Esh to all, which is to say the past. The Spirit would move him. He accomplished many things, even as a child. Now, as he comes into manhood, I, I want to reiterate again. Our Father, inasmuch as Israel has come to a state of degradation, that many times uh, God will have to use one person to carry uh, as much of a uh, plan or purpose forward as possible because the people are not going to do it. And he actually, our Father, protected his children simply by choosing this one Samson and giving him divine powers whereby the anger of the Philistines would always be against Samson and never against Israel. It's a beautiful thing the way this comes off. Therefore, my statement, Samson was a judge that didn't lead an army. He was the army. Chapter 14 and verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath. Timnath means portion. And he saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, of course, this is a no-no. You're not supposed to marry outside of your own people. It's against God's law. But I want you to watch this very closely. Another strange thing happened at this same place, Tim. Now, remember, this is where, this is where uh, Judah's daughter-in-law, Tamar, would go and sit and wait as a harlot because Judah himself kept messing around with these foreign women here. Um, in this area, which is very much against God's laws, okay? Verse 2, And he came up and told his father and his mother, and he said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Boy, you know, could he have been spoiled just a little bit? Had they, in raising and training him, spoiled him just a little bit that... He kind of got his way with everything. Well, let's read on and understand the emotions of our father. That's what you must always seek for. Verse 3. Then his father and his mother said unto him, of course, this is very, very illegal and unlawful in God's ways, word, and commandments. Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren nor among, or among all my people? that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Question. In other words, it's, this is not lawful. It's not right. 
This is not to say that the children of God who were the Philistines were were any worse people. It's just that God did not want the mixing, period. All right? It wasn't lawful. And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. So here we have. Here we have... Uh, Samson setting the stage. Now listen carefully. You want to know what's really behind the scene? Is he a spoiled brat? Is, do, do his parents, because they know God has his hand on him, do they give in to his every whim? Uh, there's one thing I want to make very clear up to this point, because we're going to have this marriage almost take place. Well, it does take place. And, and why God does this? Because they worship other gods. And... It does not mean that God it, it thinks any less of one people than another. It's just that He created us the way we are, and He loves all of us that way. All right? And that's the way it is. Uh, many people have a great deal of trouble with this, and be that as it may, there's nothing racial about it. It's Father's orders, and quite frankly, any person that breaks that law, brings a great deal of grief. I don't care who you are, if you're honest, on the child. It does. I don't care who it is, what it is, or how you want to slice it, or how you want to butter it up. I'm honest in teaching God's Word. The child suffers, all right? Um, which way is it going to go? And what is it going to be called, all right? Be that as it may. That's why God's Word states very clearly that the child suffers for ten generations. And so it is. But God still blesses and uses the children. Verse 4, as we continue. Uh, if that offends someone, then be that as it may. But I find nothing offensive about knowing that God is proud of all of us the way we are and loves us for that. So, Samson says, I want her. Verse 4. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord, that he sought an occasion. That is to say, God sought an opportunity against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. They had for 40 years. So what he really wants, what God wants, and he's going to get it done, he's going to have Samson mess up in the Philistines' eyes so that the anger of the Philistines is up on Samson rather than Israel. Um, would, does God know them better than we do? I think so. Because sometimes, you know, you really... Our people in this generation, Christians themselves, have been so brainwashed that they think that Christians must go around being beat up by everything that comes along because of one verse Charlie's that never get into God's Word any deeper than salvation, which is beautiful as it is, but after that you need a little maturity. Or you're, going to, you're not even going to be potty trained if all you know is you're saved. You're, you never mature. But God chooses men and women that make a difference. And to make a difference, you have to do it God's way. And, well, aren't you afraid that the world will talk about you? Who cares? This world is so mixed up, and their murder is not thought that much of. Usually if a murder is committed, they try to find some way to slide someone out of it when they're supposed to be hanged, killed, sent to the Father to face the one they murdered. There are no unsolved mysteries with our Father. He said to do it, and these things would cease happening among His children, and they do. Well, he was confused a little bit. Hang him, and those that are confused will get the message. They're not half as confused as they might have thought they were. They have a way of waking up and regaining their sanity in such a miraculous way. Okay, well, anyway, 
God is in control. And these people were so beaten down and so brainwashed by the Philistines that God had to have one person that didn't care what the Philistines thought, that was not afraid of the Philistines, and walked among them like a champion of God's children. That's what's about to happen, and that's why God broke His own law of mixture to allow Samson to have an eye for this Philistine woman, girl. Let's go with it now. And this is how the opportunity will come by. And boy, talk about if God wanted them angry at Samson, stick around. He did a good job of it. Verse 5, Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnah, Nephthah and came to the vineyards of Timnatha. And behold, a young lion roared against him. I mean, on the way, this trip is uh, spread out a little bit. Verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, skinned him like he would a little harmless goat. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother uh, what he had done. He could keep a secret from his mother and dad, but he had a hard time keeping it from women, all right, especially strange women. He actually, with that divine power, ripped that line apart with his bare hands. That is to say, killed him. Rent him means he tore him. Seven. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. Because, God, again, God is utilizing Samson's love for this woman, or his desire, probably better said, for this woman, to bring about the plan of God. Would God do that? Would God break His own commandment? Well, He's doing it, all right? Don't worry. It won't be consummated, all right? Don't get nervous. God, It's like God allowing the sheet of uh, bad things to come down, uh, but it'll always go back up, all right? The marriage will not be consummated. Verse 8, And after a time he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. Now, you've seen some time go by here, okay? Time has passed, and um, we're coming back now between the so-called the meeting and the marriage itself. Verse 9, And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating, and came to his father and mother, and he gave them. And they did eat of this honey, the honeycomb. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So, there we have it, and um, we're going to pick this up here in the next lecture. But we see God utilizing His servants in whatever way He so chooses to accomplish. Again, I want to reiterate, some would say, well, God's breaking His own law. I told you, you'll see the marriage is never consummated. God didn't let it come to pass, all right? But God did accomplish what He wanted to accomplish. And when you're studying your Father's Word and when you're looking for the types, that's what you want to pick up on. What is God telling you? You can make a difference. It, you may think, well, like Samson. No, Samson's only come along in one earth age, okay? We've already had our Samson. But you can make a difference if it's only in your own life, by knowing and trusting and having the faith in your Father to know that He will give you the ability to accomplish His work. You're, you may not be a speaker, a teacher, or something of that nature, but a seed planter, or a supporter thereof of any of those things. It doesn't matter. 
It all pays the same in God's eyes, and God blesses and prospers those that love Him, that follow Him, and that are champions, if you would. In a big way, if you plant one seed, if, if you... You see, do you know what a testimony is? A testimony in a troubled world like we have today is somebody that walks around sure of themselves, knowing what basically tomorrow brings, knowing that God loves them, seeing that they're not worried about every shift of the wind or every little thing that happens because we know our Father's in control and we, we're going to win anyway. That true Christians make the wake and others follow, not the reverse. Our belief is salty, and where we walk, it's a little saltier after we pass through than it was before because we have not lost our savor, that is to say, our saltiness. It's done in love, yes. And in this generation, you can make a difference because people that are shaky and frightened are drawn to strength. And it is not necessarily your strength, but your very weakness when God adds His strength to it, gives you that stability and solidifies your life into a testimony. People see that and they want what you have. You think about it. How do you acquire that? Through the Word of God. That is His Word. Those are His words. And they're true. And you can count on it. All right. Bless your hearts. You listen in a moment, won't you please?